that I was attending was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life, and he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So right. I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the Churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop... Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you, and glad you are are tuned in for another discussion tonight, another study of God's Word. We'll be opening the phone lines here after a while, and uh, so get your Bible questions ready. Hope that you have your Bible with you. Maybe your pen and pad, take notes, and uh, stay along with us. Friends, we want to uh, uh, say that um, we appreciate those of you who are watching and uh, emails and text and things like that who've been watching a long time. Appreciate you watching online, and uh, hope that you'll tell your friends about it. And... and uh, uh, let's um, let's uh, have more people involved in studying God's Word with us uh, every week as we come to you here uh, on uh, WGSR 47.1 and also online. If you're in the uh, Eden area, I want to give our content information. If you're in the Eden area, we want to remind you how you can uh, assemble with us and study God's Word with us. We meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. My phone number is 276-340-2653. We meet on Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible class and 10 a.m. for worship. Then we have Bible study at Thursdays on 7 p.m. And, of course, then we have uh, a word from the Lord uh, on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. And if you'd like to reach me, there's that's my phone number, and our word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. Of course, you're in the Martinsville area, 823 Starting Avenue in Martinsville and uh, 120 American Legion in Danville. Hope that you will uh, take advantage of those opportunities to study God's word. Tonight, our, 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 our subject, if you will, our, our topic, is uh, going to be dealing with uh, something that 
we've been hearing a lot of lately, especially, and I think we, we talked about it in some, to some detail, and or touched on it uh, in some detail, and we're dealing with all these social issues that are rising. But the idea of a separation of church and state, you know, I, we hear this all the time, and, and uh, you know, people, they want the government uh, out of their religion, and then it seems like people want the government out of their lives, but then they also turn around and say, well, we want religion out of our lives too. Now, friends, I don't know if people really realize what they're asking when they say we want a separation of church and state. You know, there are some things that even though you may want them to be separate, there are some things that are just not going to be ever totally separate uh, without some uh, dire consequences, let's say. And so when people say, uh, I want a separation of church and state, I, I want the government on one side and, and I want the, uh, the church or religion on the other side, uh, you need to realize what you're saying. Because, you know, a lot of times people ask for things and they don't really know what they're asking. Uh, I remember in, in the Bible on an occasion, you know, Peter and John said, you know, let's call down fire. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? And, and Jesus said, you know, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. You don't really know what you're asking here. And there's a lot of times people will ask for certain things or say, insist on certain things, and they don't really know the, the ramifications or the, the long, far-reaching effects of what it is that they're really asking for to take place. And so when you say separation of church and state, those of you who are <clears throat> advocating, well, we need, we need the separation of church and state, what do you really mean by that? Uh, if you just if you just Google uh, separation of church and state, you'll find a lot of different definitions about what that means. Some some indicate that what they mean is they don't want any religion at all, and they think that government then ought to be totally separate, severed, and nary the twain shall meet uh, away from religion. Now, when I say church, I'm using that term very loosely for the sense of of religion. Uh, God, even in in some instances, but they want they want they don't want any. They, you know, it's like we want to. It's almost like you'd say the nation of Islam and the KKK. They don't want to have anything to do with each other. Well, you know what, friends, that's just not possible with the church and state. It's just not possible to have a total uh, separation uh, from these two. And, I, and I'll, I'll show you why in just a moment. But let's let's talk about this. When you talk about the the ch separation of church and state. Are you saying that you don't want any biblical principles connected with government? Are you saying that you don't want any reference to God? Or you don't want any reference to uh, 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 the Bible? Are you saying that you want to, to uh, totally sever, any, uh, keep, uh, stamp out any uh, reference or... Uh, you know, re remote uh, uh, a shadow of religion or, or, or the Bible in, in your government at all? You want that totally separate? See, friends, I'm going to say you don't really know what you're asking for when you say that. And I'm going to show you this. If you were to say, let's have a separation of church and state just for this country, let's say just for this country, you want a separation of church and state. That is, you don't want any religion involved in your government then you need to understand what, you, what you'd be uh, getting rid of. Let's just take, for example, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Do you realize that the first ten amendments to the Constitution uh, that make up the Bill of Rights were added for a certain reason? Now, if we're talking about a separation of church and state, we need to understand that phrase. The, the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments were added not because people were afraid the church or religion was going to take over the government, but rather it was just the other way around. They insisted that the church be protected or religion be protected from the government. See, when people say, well, we need to, we need to keep, we need to keep the, uh, the church out of the government, really what you're asking for is you're saying what you want to do is you want to take the chain off the, the mad dog. That's what you're really saying. You're saying we want to take the fence down that keeps the dog in check. Now, now friends, when I say that, you just think about it. 
government, government that is, and I'm not going to say all government, I'm not saying government's bad, but for just for the sake of this argument, think of this. Government has always been the oppressor and the abuser of mankind. All right, now you say, well, I can, I can cite some instances where, where the church, you know, religion did that. Well, I, 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 will, I will concede that too. That's when the church takes over as the government. See that? But for the, sake of, for the sake of this argument, listen to this. When you talk about the government being severed from the Bible or from God, you're actually saying let's take the shackles off of the the very thing, the very monster that could ultimately destroy us or kill us. Now, in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution, <clears throat> when the Constitution was written, it was written by, you know, James Madison. And James Madison, by the way, uh, took a lot of, of, of his, his writings from the Virginia, the state of Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written by George Mason. So, the, the, uh, the state of Virginia had its uh, declaration written, and a lot of these principles that you find, or statements you find in the Declaration of Independence, came because individuals recognized they needed some protection, not from religion, but from the state. That's all right? So the states were, were really concerned about uh, individual liberties, and they knew that the very entity, the very uh, uh, organization that could take away those liberties was the federal government. And so they're making these, they're making these uh, 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 amendments to the Constitution so that they can protect their, their liberties. And so they wanted greater constitutional protection for the individual rights. Now, uh, <clears throat> when you look at the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights lists some specific prohibitions on government power. Now, now, now think about that. See, when you hear separating church state today, you say, well, you know, we don't want people say, well, we, we want the state to stay out of our business, stay out of our business, stay out of our business. Well, if you say the state stay out of your business, then you're going to have the government all up in your business. Because the very thing that keeps the government in check is the so-called church, all right? Now, again, I'm using that term loosely, and we're going to get into these principles in a minute. But I'm, I'm going to show you, friends, how if you take away one, you create a vacuum that will soon be filled by the other, all right? And, and, our, and our founding fathers, when you talk about this country, our founding fathers recognized, they looked at a, a long period of history, and they looked at it and they said, you know what? Whenever the government is totally in power, that's bad. And when the church or when religion gets the upper hand, it becomes the, the dominant force, that's not really good either. It's because men corrupt the position, all right? And so they said, we need a balance here. Now, if you're saying let's separate one from the other and don't let, ever let them come together, you're asking for a disaster. You're asking for trouble. And so when the Bill of Rights was written, put in our Constitution, it says, look, we want to protect... The, the freedoms that we have <clears throat> from the government. And that was why the very first amendment was written. It was protecting or protection from the government coming in and saying, this is how you must worship. All right? It was actually a protection of the church or religion from the government. And so that, that's what it's from. It, it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't written uh, and, and designed to keep the government from being influenced by the by religion, because ultimately government government comes from the same source as does religion. All right, but so so the church and state are designed to, to balance to have a balance to where there is there is a, a, a restraint on the powers that are given uh, by one. Now let's talk about this. Let's talk about the First Amendment then. We're talking about the separation of church and state. Let's look at this. Here's the First Amendment. Here's the text of it. The First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The First Amendment to the Bill of Rights says this. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
See that? Now, when you talk about the separation of church and state, the First Amendment was set in place so that the government couldn't come along and say, all right, this is how you must worship. This is, this is, you know, this is the way that you must worship. And, and all other religions are, uh, uh, you know, you're banned. All right? That, that's what the First Amendment was for. It's, it's protection so people could worship the way they choose. Now, look, I'm all for the First Amendment because I believe that if, if, if everything being equal, if we have free course to worship how we choose and no one's forcing me to worship a certain way, then the truth that we're preaching, I believe we can win hearts and minds simply by the discussion, the dialogue, the, the debate, the reasoning that takes place when individuals who are looking for the truth rightly divide the word of God, they'll come to that truth. I, I mean, I, I believe that uh, that debate and discourse uh, on God's word will bring about individuals to what God says ultimately is the truth when it comes to worship and the true church. So I don't want that, I don't want that hindered. I mean, Paul prayed this in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3. Notice this, 2 Thessalonians 3. Uh, he said, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord might have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Now, I, I pray that the word of God will have free course too. That is, that it won't be hindered. Now, if the government, if the government's not restrained, if the, if the chain's coming off, then listen, the government will, will go mad. I think you see evidence of that. We talked about this down in, down in Houston where the mayor comes in and says, all right, I'm going to subpoena all, the, all of the sermons and, if you're saying anything that I don't like, like against homosexuality, then we're you know we're going to uh, we're going you're going to suffer consequences of that. Well, wait a minute. See, that's saying people say, well, let's separate church and state, and then what the first thing the state does? The state oversteps, comes out of the yard, comes past where the fence was because you took it down, and now it's saying, all right, I'm going to dictate what you can say or what you can do. No, no, and so. You know, I don't, I don't want that, that fence to come down. But I want the religion, I want the church to have free course so that we can honestly and openly discuss the Bible. And I believe in that case, the truth will always win. It will win the hearts and minds of people. So, so the truth doesn't have anything to, to be afraid of in the arena of, of ideas when it comes to Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, whatever, the truth can withstand any of that. That's why all those preachers run. They don't want to, they don't want to be exposed to the truth. So I want the freedom for the truth to be able to dominate and to, to, uh, uh, to diminish, to expose and destroy denominational doctrines because it can, it will. In a free society where there's freedom of religion, truth will prevail. See? So I don't want the government coming in and saying, no, you can't be a Methodist because that's not the way God says. If I'm going to convert you from being a Methodist, I'm going to use the word of God. If I'm going to show you, convince you that the Baptist church is not in the Bible, I'm going to do it through the word of God. I don't need, I don't need the, uh, the, the government to come in and say, no, you can't be a Baptist. See? Because the very time the government comes and says, you can't be a Baptist, then it's going to come in and say, you can't be a Christian. It's going to tell me that. See, I don't want that. So I'm fine, I'm fine with everybody having their own belief as long as I have the freedom to convince you of the same thing. So the First Amendment, the First Amendment was designed to, uh, uh, to keep the government out of the church, out of the religion, the realm of religion, all right? So they have freedom. That's why the very next statement in the amendment is uh, are abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. All right, so there's the freedom. Now, if you separate the church and state, if you say that, no, nary the twain shall meet, <clears throat> then you misunderstand the purpose of the First Amendment. The First Amendment was don't establish 
a state religion. Now, by the way, we'll talk about this later and, and maybe have a chance to do it in more detail uh, at another time, but by the way, if you think that Islam is just a religion and should and actually should have uh, the freedom under this, First Amendment, the freedom of religion, you need to think again. Islam is not just a religion. And see, I would say, uh, I, I can make the argument that Islam does not get the same uh, 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 consideration under the First Amendment that all the rest of religions do. You know why? Because Islam is not a religion. Islam is a ideology. It is a form of government. That's why they'll take away and they'll put Sharia law in, and Sharia law will be the law of the land. Now, Sharia law, if Islam had its way, the First Amendment would be gone, and it would read something like this. You will worship Allah, and you will be under Sharia law. That is the law of the land, and that's the law, that's the religion law. It is a state religion. See that? So, I don't, I don't, I don't want Islam. Islam should not be afforded the same freedom that everyone else has who's trying to follow the Bible. All right? So, uh, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. So, this phrase, this phrase, uh, the separation of church and state, is not found in the Constitution. You need to understand that. It's not found in the Constitution. And really, the idea that most people put on it is not found in the Constitution. It is actually designed to defend or protect religion, not the other way around. So, so what do people mean when they say they want separation then? They want a separation of, of church and state. What are they really saying? Well, I think what they really mean is, I think they really mean they don't want to hear anything that would restrain them from doing whatever they want to do. I believe that's what they really mean. Now, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you could say, well, that, that's not what they mean, but I believe it is. I believe it is because when you start talking about moral uh, lifestyle, when you start talking about <clears throat> uh, what is morally right and morally wrong, they just don't want to hear that. You know, they don't want to hear what's morally right or morally wrong. They want to do their own thing, and the first thing they say is, oh, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Well, friends, you need to understand there is a, a degree of responsibility that comes with freedom, all right? And so if you, want the, if you don't want the government in your bedroom, then you have to have something that, kept that keeps that in place, see that? So the people that don't want religion to restrain them from doing whatever they want to on the moral level need to consider if you remove it, then the government's going to come in and tell you how to act morally. Now, to be honest with you, I'd rather have, I'd rather have the Bible, I'd rather have religion, religious principles put in place, helping to dictate what society should do as far as good and bad, rather than the government. Because the government doesn't have any standards other than what can get more power, see? And so, people say, well, I want to do what I want to do and I don't want to be restrained. Why would they think that? Why would they think that? I want you to notice this. Uh, I want you to notice this article. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it talks about Billy Graham, and it says Billy Graham makes this statement: "In our lawless and wicked age, we've taught the philosophy of the devil: do as you please." Now, in the article, Billy Graham, he's like ninety-six thousand years old. I don't know how old he is. Ninety-six year old. But, you know, he says, we've taught the philosophy of the devil, do as you please. And he starts talking about the fact that, you know, we let people, we let children do what they want to do, and we don't restrain them, we don't teach them Bible, we don't have Bible in school anymore, whatever. But, friends, I would say to you that Billy Graham is just, he's reaping what he's sown, is he not? I mean, his own philosophy when it comes to religion is do what you want to do. I mean, it's, Attend the church of your choice. Worship God however you want to. However you want to worship God, you don't have to know Jesus to get to heaven. So, isn't that pretty much do what you want to do? 
And it goes back to what we've said all along. These individuals, they'll violate God's principles all they want to over here. But then when they start seeing the, 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 uh, the end product of what they believe or what they teach, all the sin and the lawlessness and the iniquity that goes along with it, all the immorality that comes along with it, then they go, oh, you know, y'all are just wicked. Well, you open the door for it. Same thing we're saying about homosexual marriage. People say, well, we can't stand, you know, have two women or two men getting married together, but you didn't have a problem when a man and woman came to you and wanted to get married 20, 20 or 30 times. You know, married, divorce, married, divorce, married, divorce, and no one says anything about that. As long, you know, as long as it's a man and a woman, we're fine. You can get married as many times as you want to. And so while you're mistreating God's will over here, while you're uh, undermining God's uh, plan for marriage over here, now all of a sudden you want to stand up and be a champion of what's right and wrong over here. No, you can't have it both ways. And so our society says, I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, uh, restrained by religion. Well, the only choice then is to get religion totally out of your life. So is that what they mean when they say separation of church and state? Do they mean that they want to move all references or connections to God or religion in their life? Do you want to take all that out of the, uh, of the Constitution and all of our founding documents? Is that what you want to do? You want to remove any connection that, that we have with God and the Bible from our, uh, from our country? If so, look what you need to throw away. Here's what you're going to be throwing away. If you mean by separation of church and state, I want to remove any connection to God. I don't want anybody to tell me what's right or wrong from the Bible. If that's what you mean, look what you had to throw away. And this is just a very, very few things. I'm talking about, the, it's a small list we're going to talk about tonight. What about this? This is from the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Now, friends, this is a biblical principle. So if we're going to have a separation of church and state, then you're going to have to separate this from the Declaration of Independence. But see, the principle is all men are created equal. That's a biblical principle. That's a biblical principle. How do we know that? Well, listen to what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 30, uh, 34, Acts 10 and verse 34, now here's the apostle Peter, and he's coming to a realization, I mean, he had this prejudice that Gentiles are less people than Jews were, but he's had to learn a lesson. He's had to learn a lesson that no Gentiles are worthy of hearing the gospel just like the Jews are. And so he makes this statement. He says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Verse 35, he says, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So God is the God of all mankind. Why? Because God created man. God created man, and it is from man it is from, uh, uh, from the man that God created that all nations come into existence. Look at this. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, I know that, uh, you know, it, it's funny how, the, how much alike these two groups are. You know, the, the Christian identity, the KKK, the Christian identity, say the same, basically say the same thing that the nation of Islam say, and that is, well, God made different atoms. you got a white atom and a red atom and a green atom and a brown atom and a black atom and whatever, and that's where all the races come from. So God made, each race has their own atom. That's, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says at all. Eve was the mother of all living. Not all living white people and all li or all living black people or all living brown people, but the mother of all living. Why? Because God made man. And man, in God's eyes, is equal. And so when you, when you say, well, all men are created equal, that's, in the, that's, that, that's from the Bible. Well, we have to take it out of the Constitution. Now, or do you want to leave it in the Constitution? If you want to leave it in the Constitution, then you really realize that you haven't really separated church and state because you've got a biblical principle within the state's documents. All right, Acts 17, verse 26. Let's look at this. Acts 17, verse 26.
God hath made of, of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth? God made of all nations one blood? He made all nations out of one blood? That's right. Because all men are equal in God's sight. All men are equal in God's sight. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. We'll give you another principle here. Another, another verse here. This is, a, this is the biblical principle I'm showing you that is rooted in the document of the state. This is a church, and I'm using that in the sense of religious. This is the religious principle that, is, that comes from the Bible. Paul said there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, how is that possible? It's possible because God doesn't make a distinction between male and female, bond and free, Jew or Greek, when it comes to saving mankind. He looks at all men the same. All men need to repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9. God commands all men everywhere, Acts 17 and verse 30, to repent. Now, if that were the case, if, if it were the case that, that God is not a, or if it's the case that God does not consider all men equal, then why would he say all men everywhere? Because he looks at them all the same. See that? So this, this, this uh, principle that you, that you see in our Declaration of Independence, it's a biblical principle now. Are you going to get rid of that? Are you going to throw that away? Now somebody says, well, well, James, you know, in our country we don't really believe that because, you know, it took a long time. It takes a long time for, for, for there to be equality amongst men. And even today there's, there's still not total equality. Well, you know what, friends? there probably will never be total equality in the sense of the application of the principle because men are going to be involved and men have biases and prejudices. But the point is, it is a principle that if men follow, comes from God's word. You see, you, you, can't, you don't throw out the principle because man don't keep it. And that's what people say about religion. I just get tired of organized religion. A bunch of hypocrites out there. Well, does that mean the system's wrong? Because people don't operate the system right? You know? Is, is, is a car wrong because someone got drunk and ran, in, ran into, and, and killed, into another car and killed someone? Does that, does that make the car wrong? You know? Is the speed limit broken because someone exceeds the speed limit? No. It's just that <clears throat> men need to be restrained and be taught restraint. And you only get that if you have godly principles. If you have a moral, objective standard. That's what we've been saying all along. That's the Bible. So if you want to separate church and state, then you, you've got to take these principles out of our founding documents. All right? All men are created equal. Where did, you, where did you come up with that? Where did that phrase come from? It came from the Bible. It came from the truth that existed long before long before the men wrote the Declaration of Independence. It existed long before our country was even founded. It existed long before, see, nations were established. It's always been there. That's a truth that has always existed. All right? Now, you want to separate church and state? What about this? <clears throat> what about this? Here's just another statement from the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, you say, well, you know, that, that's not a Bible principle. Yes, it is a Bible principle. It's a, it's a biblical principle. Endowed with their creator certain inalienable rights. Look at this. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, now we just read uh, a verse in this context. Let's go back. Here's verse 26. God, uh, he hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined before times uh, uh, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of, of their habitation. All right, now let's look. Verse 27. He says that if they should 
seek the Lord, they happily might find, might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now look at verse 28. For in him, that's in the Lord, in him we live and move and have our very being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. It is in God that we live, move, and have a very being. God is the giver of, he's the giver of life. Now, if you want to say, well, man gets rights because of who they are. No, you don't get rights because of simply who you are. You don't get rights from the government. Rights are things that are given you as a result of you're God's creature. Now, that's what our founding fathers are recognizing. There are some things that people deserve because they are human beings. Now, if you want to separate the church, church and state, that is, if you want to separate Bible, any reference to God or biblical principles from the government, then you've got to take this away too. And if you say, well, no, that, we'll leave that one in there. We like that one. Well, then why is it that you get to pick and choose? If this biblical principle is good enough for you to leave in, then why aren't other biblical principles good enough to live by? See this? But God is in charge. God is the giver of life. He's, he's the one that sustains us. Look at in Job uh, 12, Job 12 verse 9, Job says, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? In whose hand, this is, this is in God, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Now, our founding documents say that every man is equal and has a creator. God is the creator. Now, there are certain things that you should recognize about a person because we all came from the same place. We all came from the same creator. That's why human rights are such that are so, so valuable. You ought to treat people as human beings. All right? And so those are the things that, that are founding uh, uh, fathers are, 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 are talking about when they're writing this. You see, they looked, they looked at history and they were looking at their present situation and they recognized that, you know what, in some instances you only get certain rights because of who you are. Where you were born, where you were, you know, what, what class you were born into. Over in India, you're born into a caste system and that, that, you know, you can't get out of it. They recognize that, you know, there are certain things that a person should, should be entitled to simply because they're human beings. All right? Certain inalienable rights. Now, they say life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you have to understand that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, life, is certainly given by God. It is certainly a, a right that is given by God. Liberty, you know, certain liberties are not granted just because you're alive, just because you're a human being. If you violate someone else's rights, that is, say you take away a life, does that mean you still have liberty? No. You give up some things. You forfeit some things. You may forfeit your liberty. The pursuit of happiness, it has to be governed by other godly principles, right, that are, that are determining what is right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. So if your pursuit of happiness leads you into an area of immorality, no, that's not what God has given you. That's not an unalienable right. That right can be taken away from you. If you derive pleasure, if you derive your pursuit of happiness from killing someone, is are you, are we talking about that? Is the are we talking about that as the as the uh, power of 
Or is, are we talking about that as the the right that is granted by God? No. But see, they they recognize that. Well, we're used to deriving rights from the king. The king says, "Well, you you can have this right, or you can do this, or you can do that." No. There there are certain things that we ought to be able to do simply because we're human beings and we have free will. That's what God has created us with. That's the that's the unalienable right that should not be taken away. And so when you're talking about these principles, now I'm trying to show you, friends, that the people that want to say separate the church and state, they want a lot of the principles that the Constitution will give them, but yet those principles are rooted in the Bible. So they want to separate, they want to take the the rights that are granted them, but yet separate from the very thing that gives them these rights. That's like killing the goose that lays the golden egg. See that? So is that what, you're, is that what we're going to do? Uh, let's look one more here. What about the idea of separation of powers? You ever stop and wonder why we have three branches in our government? The executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch? Say like the president, the Congress, and, and the Supreme Court. What's, what's the point of that? The separation of powers is a biblical principle. Did you realize that, friends? Do you realize that if you say, well, I want, I, want, I, don't, I want to separate church and state, well, the very thing that really gives some security to our country is based upon a Bible principle of the separation of powers. Now, what do you, you mean to tell me that you can look up in your concordance and you can find separation of powers in the, in the Bible? No. You mean you can find checks and balances in the Bible? No. But you can find the principle there. How do I know that? Well, look, why is it that it is not good, why is it that it's not good for one branch of government to have all the power? As a matter of fact, I think the president is speaking tonight and he's going to talk about how he's going to make a law just by, right, by, by you know, authorizing something. That's not the Constitution. That is not in the Constitution because it is designed so that one man or one group of men don't have all the power. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, God knows that. God knew that was a good thing. Look at this. In Acts 14, verse 23, and we've talked about this when it comes to, uh, when it comes to elders, you know, every time you see the church and elders in the church, there's always plural. In Acts 14, verse 23, when they had ordained them elders in every church, ordained elders in every church, Titus, Titus 1 and verse uh, 5, Paul said, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. Why is it always more than one? Why is it always uh, more than, than one? Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timotheus, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops. Now why is it that they're always, they're always plural? Friends, there's a reason for that. It's because it's checks and balances. If one man has the rule, then guess what? He is more likely to take the power, he's more likely to take power, take liberties, because no one is there to stop him. Now that's a biblical principle. Look, let's put someone else in place here so that somebody else will be accountable. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 16, for example. Look what Paul says. Now Paul's talking about collecting a large sum of money. He's taking, he's taking up this collection to take back to Jerusalem. And he's going to be carrying this, this money with him. And he says, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care unto the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. Now watch this. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. That's a contribution. The grace is that contribution. Which is administered unto us, administered to us by the glory of the, the same Lord 
and the declaration of your ready mind. Now watch this. Watch this. Avoiding this. Now why did he take Titus and another brother and, and even other brethren, why did he take them with him? Avoiding this that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord but also in the sight of men. See, the principle is if you have people involved, then there's some accountability that takes place. It's checks and balances. See, I'm watching you and you're watching me and he's watching you and he's watching me and we're both watching him. See, it's, it's a checks and balances here. Now, that's a biblical principle. And yet it's right there in our government. Our government is based upon this principle that you find in the Bible. Now, here is why this is so important, that these principles be in place in our lives. And you don't really want separation of church and state totally because if you do, then you remove that. And the next thing you know, if you remove that checks and balances, you, you take away one of the balance or one of them gets out of balance, you're going to have trouble. If you don't think balances, checks and balances are, are good, just go get new tires put on your car and tell the guy that's putting them on, now I want you to balance three wheels, but don't balance the fourth one. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble because one of them's going to be out of balance, see? When you have absolute power by the state, or you have absolute power by the church, and I'm saying religion, then it, it could be abused by those who are in power. Now just think about that. Everybody talks about, well, the Catholic Church. You want know the problem the Catholic Church has? Aside from the fact that you can't find the Bible and it's not authorized by God. But the problem is, one man has all the authority. One man has all the authority. He, he can dictate what goes on. He dictates what everybody does. See that? So it says, well, I remember when the, you know, when the, the so-called church, you know, was, was, was killing people, the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades, and they were going back killing our, everybody. Well, if religion, if religion is, ceases to follow godly principles, it's out of balance too. And if the state, the government, gets out of balance, guess what? It's going to have trouble too. That's why we're always stressing the importance of the Bible. We're always stressing the importance of the Bible. See, biblically, biblically principled, principled men, if they're following God's principles, if they're following the Bible principles, truth that you find in God's Word, then they're going to be restrained. This is what they're going to live by. If you have people who are living by this word, you want, they're not going to steal. They're not going to embezzle. But what do you have in our, in our government today? You have people that are involved in embezzling and corruption. Why? Well, no one instilled in them biblical principles to live by. There is, there is no guidelines, no, nothing that's restraining them. Wasn't somebody just uh, 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 arrested for embezzlement down here in Ridgeway? Uh, I, I thought I heard someone say that on the news. But anyway, but, but why does that happen? Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton didn't pay, I uh, uh, saw some news, Al Sharpton didn't pay, he's back behind $4.8 million worth of back taxes that he didn't pay on his payroll taxes for his charity, and he was taking money from his charity to use to pay for his children's private schools. What's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with that. But why did he do it? Well, the so-called reverend wasn't following the Bible. See that? You see what I'm talking about? When people are in power, but they're not governed by biblical principles. Well, oh, we, we want to separate. We want to separate church. We want to get the church out of our lives. Okay, that's what you get. You get people who say, "All right, you know, there's there, there's no guidelines." I don't, I don't care about being restrained by those guidelines. 
let's just do what we want to do. Well, all right, you're letting the dog out. You're letting the mad dog off the chain. You're opening the gate, let him out of the yard. See that? And so that's why we're saying you can't separate the church and the state. You've got to have the balance for both of them to exist and so that people can live in, in harmony. Friends, you realize this. Uh, a study was done by the University of Houston, and they examined uh, 15,000 documents from America's founders, and they found that 34% of their quotations came from the Bible. Now, it sounds to me like those men who were putting in place the, the documents and forming, forming this country that we live in recognize that there is a truth there is a uh, uh, th there's a truth that can that can make a country great and it's it's God's word it's the bible and if and if people would live by these truths then our country would be better and men who would adhere to these would be greater leaders but if you ever got away from these principles, if you totally separated the state from these principles, then you'd have chaos. Here's what Noah Webster said. He said, the moral principles and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Now that's true. That's true. You know why we have slavery in this country to begin with? Because we didn't follow this precept. Then follow his precept. See that? So when, when, you, when you get away from those precepts, when you neglect them, then you open up the door for all kinds of trouble. See that? You open the door for all kinds of, uh, uh, of problems. Um, I'm uh, losing a verse here. So what is it? Ignore it. But see, but isn't this true? When, when these principles, these are the truth. If you say, well, there's no moral standard, there's no objective standard, then the standard is going to be whoever's strongest. And if you give people who aren't governed by these principles, you give them the power of the state, well, guess what? They're going to step not only on your religious liberty, they're going to step on all your other liberties. And they're going to start dictating other aspects of your life. That's why. That's why we always are pressing and we're always pushing and we're always insisting that this book be what guides your life, friends. This is what's going to make our society better, these principles. Right? It's not Republican, Democrat, or Independents. Because those kind of men don't matter if they're not governed by these principles. See? So you can't have a separation of church and state without having chaos. Now, here's why I say that. Because ultimately the state is connected to the same source that wrote the Bible. The same source that wrote religion or uh, that instituted the church also instituted the state and that's God God ordained government look at this in Romans 13 verse 1 and I'm running up on, against the clock here and I know I didn't open the phone lines and and let you call in but uh, maybe we'll take get that another day but look at this in Romans 13, 1, Paul says, Let every soul be subject to the high powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, 
resisteth the ordinance of God. Whoso resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Now, friends, do you realize what, what, what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying if you resist the government, you're resisting the arrangement, the institution that God put in place. Now, why would God put in place, why would he ordain a government that would then turn around and oppress people? The same reason why he ordained the family. And yet men abuse their wives and their children and don't take care of them because they got away from following the principles that make that system work. Same reason why the Catholics, you know, are pedophiling, you know, pedophile, full of pedophiles and, and abusing, uh, you know, altar boys and whatever. Why? Because they got away from Bible principles. There wouldn't even be a, a, a Catholic church if they'd have stuck to the principles. See that? And you wouldn't have governments that oppress people and kill people who disagree with the government if they all follow this book. That's why Paul says the powers that be ordained of God. They're ordained of God. But he says, let every soul be subject to the higher power. Why? Because God intended, God intended for that power to be in existence for, for good. He says, for rulers are not terrible good works, but to evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Verse 4. And he says, wherefore, verse 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay, ye tribute also, that they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. You want the government is good if it's governed by biblical principles. And how is it going to be governed by biblical principles? Well, you have to make sure that you don't separate the government from the church, from the Bible, from God's word. See that? The church and the government have their same root. Same origin, and that is the mind of God. They're good things. They're good things if we follow them. But failure to do so will only bring suffering. Look at this, Proverbs 29, verse 2. We have time for this one, Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 2. Did I get it in there? Uh... Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. The only way that we're go you're going to have enjoy prosperity and good times, liberty really, is if we're all following God's principles. But if you abuse that liberty and say, you know, I'm going to seek now pleasure and pursuit of happiness outside the boundaries of God's principles, guess what? You're opening the door for wickedness. And you're opening the door for unrighteous people to take control. Friends, you can't separate church and state. They're both ordained by God. That's why we need to follow the Bible to make sure that both are in keeping with his will. Friends, I hope this has helped. I hope if we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Till next time, remember, uh, every Thursday night right here on WGSR, always ask what does the Bible say, and you always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. the chance to start your holiday season off right. Reedsville, the first area, uh, your first municipality, first uh, part of our coverage area to have their Christmas parade. And uh, that's coming up and uh, on Saturday starting at 4 o'clock. So we'll have a look at the forecast and let everybody know uh, what we can expect, how to dress for that. I think it's going to be okay. I think you'll be fine. You may want to layer, though, just in case. Matt will be up with that in just a little bit. Don't forget, it's Thursday. The United Way report's coming up. Debbie Moore is the chairperson. I want to keep saying chairman. Chairperson for this year's campaign, and she'll be up with uh, the United Way report and some special guests in just a little bit. A lot of news to cover from all across the region, including 
a superintendent in our coverage area, the 2015 Superintendent of the Year. I'll tell you more about that in just a few moments. But right now, let's take a look at some of our top stories of the day. Two Eden residents will appear before a judge in December after one was charged with impersonating a law enforcement officer and kidnapping and obtaining money under false pretenses. His alleged accomplice was charged with aiding and abetting. According to the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office, they said that this whole case started out on Saturday night, November the 15th. That's when a Reedsville area man reportedly met with two individuals, a man and a woman, at an Eden, con uh, 